The show is brought to you by Rudus Metal Detectors, makers of the Alter 71. Discover new possibilities at rutus.com.pl. This is the Global Discovery Adventures Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Lance Goolsby, an ex-U.S. military soldier with 15 years experience, got out after the war in Iraq, and I'm using metal detecting as a therapy for my post-traumatic stress disorder. I thank each and every single one of you for tuning in and giving us the chance to listen to this great, great episode. Uh, Now, just to give a little bit of backup on what's been happening in the last episode, uh, we found out that there's several families in the Scottish area who may be tied in to Oak Island. Uh, James McQuiston has done a whole lot of research into this and has discovered that not only do these families have connections to each other through the Knights Templar, but also through the uh, First Order of the Freemasons out of Edinburgh, Scotland. So uh, that brings us to the point where we are right now that... uh, One person was caught for stealing some of the treasure from one of the men. And uh, instead of facing jail time, the men actually worked it out amongst themselves and shortly thereafter disappeared out of Scotland. And so that's where we're at. Uh, So let's get back into this. Uh, Now, for everybody who uh, is new to this, please, please, please help us out. Subscribe. And let us know how we're doing wherever you listen to it on Spotify, iTunes, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcast. We really appreciate every single one of those reviews. It does help us out. Believe me, it does does help us out so um make sure you do that and this show is made possible from donations from people and companies like yourself if you feel inclined to help us out and help us make a better show and actually maybe travel around and get interviews with some people around the world let us know by going to gdapod.com the website for the show and click on that top right button where the links are and click on make a donation it really does help us out And it helps us really make a better show for you guys. Both myself, 42, producer Luke and producer Dave would really appreciate it. This is an expensive hobby to do, but we're doing this out of love for you guys. And we don't make any money off of this, believe me. We do not. So I'm going to go ahead and shut up and uh, go ahead and get on with the show. As you know, in 1798, two young men discovered a block and tackle hanging from a tree on a small island off the Nova Scotia coast called Oak Island. And from that point till now, Oak Island has been shrouded in mystery. And today, Marty and Rick Lagina are currently out there trying to find what is hidden out on the island. Today's guest is James McQuiston, theorist and author and uh, personal friend of Rick Lagina who has been out to the island and has been talking with them about his new theory of where the treasure that is maybe buried on the island originates from. So we're going to be talking uh, about his theory in part two of the secrets of Oak Island. His trial is delayed two more times. So over a one-year period, it was set for three different days. It was never, ever held. The following year, right as the Knights Baronet were being established, Al Strachan and all the other people involved were given complete remission for their crime. So nobody went to jail for stealing this gigantic treasure. And where I found the treasure was in the history of Lodge Number 1 of Freemasons in Edinburgh. In their book. Was the treasure ever recovered? That's that was my next question. Yeah. So I went to uh, the Society of Antiquaries and asked them. They didn't know. So they sent me to about three different emails at the Scottish National Museums. I wrote all them, explained it all. They didn't know. They sent me to about three different emails at the Scottish National Records. They did not know what happened to the treasure. But they did know that it was a true story because they pointed me to the Privy Council minutes where the trials had been delayed 
a couple times. And then when the king finally gave Strachan remission for his sins uh, in early 1625, just before they created the Knights Baronet. So that verified the story, that the story was true. And then I found snippets of the treasure in two other books, but the full treasure is spelled out in this Masonic book. So the, it was after this all happened that the, that he was accepted in as a Freemason. So the, uh, and this isn't to uh, in any way disparage Freemasonry, you know, because this was way back when, and this is, this was a lot of powerful Scotsmen involved, probably the most powerful Scotsmen in, that there were at the time involved. And I think the whole goal was they knew that Nova Scotia wasn't going to be a success. They were given all the land, but they knew if, if they didn't have money, it, nothing was going to happen. They stole the treasure. Um, they took it with them when they went there in 1628. And, uh, when they were forced to leave, they didn't want to take it back to Scotland because people were probably still wondering where the hell it was. And they may have had other things like clan treasures because all the people, all the original people that signed up were the chieftains of the clans. And within those clans, there were tons of Templar uh, connections. So they may have even had some Templar uh, treasure and they were trying to take it all there to finance Nova Scotia. And then when it went sour, they didn't want to take it all back. To, they probably, A, didn't want to risk it getting dumped into the ocean during spring storms. They didn't want probably a lot of people back there to know that they even had it all. And they may have just thought this was a bump in the road, that uh, you know all, all that was going to disappear with the French and they were going to be able to go back to their big plan. So I think that's why they buried it on Nova Scotia, and I think there's a chance that one of their ships wrecked, and that may be another reason that they um, had to get they had to, they had all the, these belongings and and all the stuff. You know, they had to do something with it. So their decision was to bury it. Now Fred Nolan said that he found eleven places on the island where he felt that something had been dug out of the ground and drug down to the coast. Really, then there's also the money pit, and mm -hmm. the McGinnis descendants said that their those three original gentlemen had found three chests full of worth of treasure. They didn't say they found three chests filled with treasure; they said worth of treasure. And Fred Nolan had found three empty chests in the swamp area. So, um, when was that? Uh, well, he was he was there. He just passed away a couple of years ago, and he had been there for fifty years. So it'd be within the last fifty years. Uh, yeah, he uh, yeah he's someone that spent uh, forty something years on the island, right? Yeah, and he was a surveyor by trade, so he surveyed the yeah. whole island. And when he passed away, his son did two things for the Laginas. Number one, he gave them permission to search his father's land which they never had up until that day. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, he gave them all of his father's arc or, uh, surveying drawings which yeah. is, that were massive drawings. Yeah, very I mean, invaluable uh, Rick, items. They were so large because he was trying to demonstrate everything in perspective. And they were so big that when Rick rolled one of them out on the the ground on one of the shows, he could actually crawl on it. <laughs> you know, it was oh, like a car. You know. So... Um, and Fred Nolan had found a number of, of parts from ships in the swamp. And, uh, and in fact, the Oak Island team has found some too. So the swamp itself, it's triangular and it's kept away from the Mahone Bay, which is essentially the Atlantic Ocean coming into the bay by uh, Brim, which is a, a road, but that road was only built in the 1930s. Mm. And in 2016 winter, it almost washed out. So if you could imagine no humans being there and Mother Nation, Nature having her way with the area, it would have been a cove. So, you know, the waters around Oak Island, this is another thing, that the waters around Oak Island, I, I've seen two different depth charts. They are as deep as 30 foot in some areas. Not, mm. Now, not right up to the island, but back a ways where you would normally anchor a tall ship. And then you would take a smaller tender or 
panace, they call them, or whatever, into land, you know, with your treasure or whatever else you were taking yeah. in, or even a raft. Uh, so the ships could get there. Well, in addition to that, there is a direct wind tack from the open ocean almost to Oak Island. It goes into a yacht club that's just off to the right of Oak Island, but all you'd have to do is turn like 20 or 30 feet towards Oak Island. If you were following, it, the, 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 the uh, yacht club actually prints the map to show its members how to get in there without hitting bottom, you know. And you could go right up their trail that they draw and then just make a slight turn to the left and you're parked at Oak Island. Yeah. And Doug had told me about it originally, but he didn't tell me about that map. I found that on my own, that Yacht Club map. But that verified what he had told me. So if you were going to ride a a direct wind tack back in the 1600s into Mahone Bay and you were, and you were using some kind of depth sounding devices, you know, I think they used to use like rocks or weights on the end of ropes, you know, and they give a reading where so many fathoms deep or whatever, yeah. you would have taken that exact same path. And it would have taken you right back to the island and there was, or right back to the back of the bay and there was Oak Island. So people that say, well, there's lots of islands. Well, a lot of the islands, you couldn't sail a tall ship to them. You know, there's 300 and some islands, but a lot of them, you couldn't get to them unless you took a, a smaller boat a longer way to get to them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Anyway, so he stole that treasure. I believe that that's at least part of what was uh, buried on the island. But what, what's really interesting about it is that he stole it from a man named Keith, who was the marshal of Scotland. Uh, and his position was a little more than what we would think of a marshal in the United States. He protected the king, but he also protected the uh, crown jewels. So whenever there was uh, trouble for the king, he would take them and hide them at one of his castles and he owned 30 castles. Wow. And, um, and he had just this incredible fortune that's on this list that they stole. And he was on his deathbed at the age of 70. And I think what happened was Strachan and I think Alexander was in on it. He certainly was in on it and getting them off from the crime. But, um, there were other people involved in it. I think they thought when, if, when he dies, all of this estate that he's got, this massive estate, is going to be all divvied up and uh, caught up in court cases. People will be suing for 100 years over it, blah, blah, blah. Or we can just go and steal the damn thing <laughs> and go finance Nova Scotia. <laughs> and one of the partners of Al Strachan and William Alexander was William Keith, the very son of the man that was robbed. Yeah, And he was a partner with them. Now, if you were just robbed of a big inheritance, the last thing you do is go into a partnership with with one guy who stole it and the other guy that got that guy off from getting arrested for it. So I think the fix was in. I think these people, this was right at the time that Alexander was going there. He was writing about how he needed money. They looked at this big fortune. They knew the guy was dying any day. They said, we're just going to go in, steal it. Take it over there, finance or finance the ships. Maybe they use some of it to finance because they took four ships over, and and it you know their valuables got ended up or ended up getting buried there. And so the next question would be, well, is there any proof that there's that they're buried there? And four items have been found in the money pit that could be connected to this treasure list. And one of them is gold chain. The treasure list listed specifically two gold chains. Well, in 1897, a drill bit came up with three links of gold chain. Up. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Yeah. That could be any gold chain, you know, but at least it's on the list. The other thing is there's a lot of uh, pottery. Well, uh, Robert Dunfield, who had bulldozed the money pit area, he missed it by a little bit. But yeah. he had sent some pottery to... Uh, Oxford University, and they dated it to the six, early 1600s, which is my time period. Yeah. Well, uh, and it, on the treasure list, it said all the plenishings of these castles. Well, that is a uniquely Scottish word, but it essentially means the same thing as furnishings. It okay. means all your day-to-day -day utensils and chairs and things that don't have a intrinsic value as treasure 
you know, like a like a piece of jewelry would, but so they're the, still worth something. So the stuff in the back of a U-Haul truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that could qualify for that. Now it could qualify for other things, but because it was dated to the early 1600s and uh, that was on the list, you know, that's a good candidate. Uh, the other thing was uh, on the list was uh, 36 dozen gold buttons. And uh-huh. the reason why they had gold buttons back then was uh, they would actually wear them on their suit coats. And then if they ran into somebody they owed money to, it would pop a button off. And ah. ask them if they could, you know, settle the deal there. Well, they found uh, in 2017, when they were going through the spoils from the money pit, they found a gold plated button. Now, whether a gold plated button equals, you know, equates to a gold button on this list, I don't know, but they're both buttons and they both had gold on them. Yeah. Well, the final one, though, is the big kicker because they also pulled up a piece of parchment in 1897. It, it's very small. It has two letters on it. You may have seen photos of it. I don't know. Yeah, they talked but, about uh, it, I think, in season two. They talked uh, exclusively about that one. Yeah. So, um, and how, and I didn't even know where the thing was or if it still existed. I'd seen a lot of photos, but when I was riding up to New Ross with Rick and Doug, we were in one of those vans where they have the hidden cameras and all that. Mm. And, uh, uh, we were, we were just talking about items and I mentioned that parchment and he said, well, I own that. And I said, you own it. It still exists. He said, yeah, I own it. And I'm like, wow, you know, and I wanted to see it, but I, you know, you're, you're, you have to walk a fine line of what you're requesting from the big guys, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But uh, then this season, this last season, they actually showed it on the show and, and they had it in that little archive room and they put a microscope on it and put it up on the uh, uh, screen so you could see it. Well, what he told me that day was that they absolutely tested it to be parchment. They had not tested the ink or tried to do DNA, which you can do because it's a, uh, it was sheepskin, so it was biological, yeah. or carbon dating. Because it was so small, they would destroy it. So they were trying to figure out what the best step forward was with the parchment. Because if you know you're going to just, it's so small that you're probably going to destroy at least half of it. And do you want to do that? Because it's such an artifact that was found in the money pit that, you know, do you, you know, so that's where they're at on that right now. Yeah. And since the money pit is flooded in, if there was any more parchment down there, it would have been completely destroyed after the flood in. Exactly. And the flood in happened back in 1804 and they found this in 1897, which means this parchment was down there for 93 years in a water filled pit. But what I, the last item on the treasure list said a grit, this is pretty much verbatim a grit cloth bag containing therein the title deeds to the castles well i didn't know what grit cloth bag meant and i was thinking of grit cloth like that sandpaper you buy to to sand metal down with when you're working (laughs) your car or whatever yeah so i rode over to my folks in scotland and they said no grit meant great it was just the way they wrote the word great back then and the cloth bag was a canvas bag that was soaked in wax. They would put charts, oh. particularly, uh, particularly title deeds for properties in them, seal them up. And they actually called them seal bags. And the reason they did it was because these castles would stay in the, in the hands of the same family for sometimes up to 100 or 200, 300 years. So they had to know that when they opened up that uh, seal bag to sell the the property, they could pull that charter out two or three hundred years later, and it would be the India ink wouldn't be smeared, and it would all be in the same good shape. Yeah, and just to prove that it works and can last, uh, the Declaration of Arbroath, which was essentially the Scottish Declaration of Independence, yeah, was was written in 1320, and it still exists today. You can still read it today because of it being on parchment. So uh, when they pulled up parchment in 2017 that Jack found in the spoils pile, it was all smeared, but the other parchment wasn't. So that told me that other parchment was in a waterproof container until that drill bit hit it. Yeah. 
punctured a waterproof container, which was probably a grip clock bag. That was wax coated. Pick, pick that piece up, and it was still legible. But then for the next hundred or so years, while that nobody knew what was going on down below, the water was seeping into these bags, or at least that bag, and destroying the, yeah. you know, smearing the India ink all over the parchment. So now when they look at the parchment, it's all purple, smeared purple from the India ink. So now you've got uh, uh, four items that all match to some degree exactly what was on the treasure list. So now they know, because I gave them the treasure list, <laughs> they know specifically what to look for. Whenever they find anything that's on that treasure list, they can put another check mark on, on the list. So that, that piece of parchment had to be for something valuable, because they told me, uh, the people in Scotland said, parchment was so expensive that they didn't just put day-to-day documents on it. It was no. almost always for title deeds for property or uh, agree- major agreements like the Declaration of Arbor or something like that because mm-hmm. it was just too expensive. You had to kill a lot of sheep to get you know the parchment and whatever. So, um, so that's what I think was in there. That's what I think is being pulled out. Uh, what shape it's in is questionable because in 1863, when they were working, uh, they heard the pit collapse three different times. Yeah. And I believe it collapsed into an underground water-filled cavern that they didn't even know was there. And it's a debris field now. And I believe that Rick believes that, too, because he's talked, he's said the words debris field several times. And uh, so I think they think it collapsed into this underground cavern, spread out, it cracked open whatever they were in, or maybe some of it isn't cracked open yet, and it spread a debris field down there. And so when they run these drill bits down, they're just pulling up bits and pieces of that debris field. You, they brought up the two human bones. You probably remember that. Uh, one was uh, carbon dated, or they were both carbon dated from the mid 1600s to the mid 1700s. The the um, one was of European descent and the other was of Middle Eastern descent. Huh. And my question to them just recently that somebody else actually prompted the question was, well, if you did DNA on them, go to one of these big DNA places like Family Tree DNA and say, we will pay you. We want to submit this DNA as if it was ours today. Compare it to everybody in your database and give us an answer. And then you could see if it was if it was one of these families from the Knights Baronet, yeah, you know, it was the the McLean family or the uh, another family's the Wardlaw family, um, the McDonald family, whatever, you know, you could say, oh yeah, uh, by the way, the one from Europe was from Clan Campbell, and we know they were on the trip, you know, whatever. So uh, I just sent that off to him a while ago as a suggestion that I was given from another gentleman. But there's a lot happening, and uh, uh, there was uh, the, the, this is where it gets a little dicey on what I can say, but the symbol of the Strachan clan since at least 1320 was uh, the stag. And they found a, uh, they actually found a thing that would imprint on old charters, uh, a matrix, they call it. Mm. Uh, metal detectors found it. And it was the same one that was on a document from 1320. Oh, nine. So they know that it, it's all legitimate. And they have tons of coats of arms with the stag on them. So the stag was very uh, significant to the Strachan family. It still is today. It's still on your coat of arms. Well, the this is really just absolutely wild. But I, I was one day I was thinking, well, I wonder if there's any Strachans that live around Oak Island. So I looked it up. There's about 30 of them that I found up in Halifax or Dartmouth, which is right close to Halifax. So I wrote Doug, and I said, wow, this is kind of interesting that I'm thinking it's the Strachan treasure buried there, and uh, and all these Strachans are living in that area. <laughs> so he wrote me back, and he said, oh, my God, you're not going to believe it. But he said, back in 1857, John Strachan owned the Nolan Cross lots and sold them. Now you got a Strachan right on Oak Island owning some of the most significant lots, which are the Nolan Cross lots. Yeah, those are where um, the Nolan Cross lots. That's where it looks like uh, uh, stone ruins of a house were sitting there. Correct. Well, that one is one where it's actually a big cross made out of uh, 
dome shaped uh, dome shaped rocks that are ah. not anywhere else on the island. And there's seven of them. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six of them that make up the cross. Yeah. Okay. And I remember. Yeah. They they plotted those with a GPS and they saw the uh, saw what it created the cross by doing that. And they a uh, couple theorists have come up with uh, methods where the arms of the cross can point to the money pit. Now they, they triangulate it at least. The one thing that gets me uh, more so than, wow, I looked up at the stars and I could take that constellation. And if I twist it sideways and shrink it a little bit, it'll fit Oak Island, yeah. you know, which to me doesn't mean anything. But the other one is it's a straight line from here to the money pit. Well, I'm a straight line to the money pit. So are you, you know, I mean, the, it, it, a straight line goes anywhere, but when you can triangulate it and get two lines to go to it, now you've got something going. And the, one of the recent theorists on there uh, showed a way that some of the, uh, the arms from Nolan cross would point to triangulate to the, to the rough area of the money pit. And where he pointed to was the last place they dug that you saw on the, on the screen or, yeah. uh, a couple episodes ago. But the Nolan cross, can we honestly uh, believe that the topography of the cross has not been changed by the massive bulldozing that was done? I think it was back in the sixties where so much of the topography was completely destroyed. Well, that's the one thing that did not get touched. Uh, he, uh, it was Robert Dunfield and he bulldozed, the Money Pit Hill, which is yeah. quite a distance away, and he bulldozed Smith's Cove, uh, which uh, also uh, Dan Blankenship had done a lot of work in Smith's Cove, and then yeah. this year they did a ton of work there and found about six different structures down there that are uh, unexplained, that they're still getting carbon dating on them and that kind of stuff. But um, but yeah, no, nobody touched Smith's, or okay. nobody touched Nolan's Cross. For one reason, Fred Nolan owned it, and he didn't yeah. let anybody on his property. He didn't even let the Laginas on his property. Uh, it wasn't until he passed away. And his son, said, yeah. What the heck, you might as well, you know. So, uh, and it was a shame because he just made an agreement with, Rick talked him into it of making an agreement, you know, he's, he soft-sold him a little bit there and got him to agree to cooperate, and then he passed away. So now that left them in the lurch, so... Rick and Doug went to his son who owns a construction company on the mainland mm -hmm. and said, you know, your father did all this work. You're not invested in it like he was, but we are. And if, you know, if we could throw in together and look at his drawings and, and metal detect your property and everything, who knows what we're going to, so they made some kind of a deal and he said, yeah, have at it. So, um, so that's why it was protected. But, um, so, but the other thing about it is Al Strachan, well, first of all, I got to back up to 1630, the land around Oak Island and New Ross was granted as part of a larger grant to the former French governor of Acadia as to form an alliance with the new Scots governor, who was William Alexander. And, uh, uh, the witness to the charter was Al Strachan. So now you have Al Strachan stealing the treasure right when they needed it. You have him, the third Freemason, you have him uh, signing as a witness to the property uh, uh, in that general area, the larger yeah. general area there. And now in, a, in the 1800s, you've got John Strachan owning the Nolan Cross lots on Oak Island. And he's also a Freemason in Halifax <laughs> and uh, this one that I just discovered at, at, I, I actually put parts of this in my book on the Saturday before my appearance on Tuesday that's how recent it was Wow! Dalhousie University up in Halifax has been connected with Oak Island in a number of ways one is that the Oak Island Association that was formed after after the boys dug the pit and gave up and they had to bring a syndicate in to do it. They met at Dalhousie University when they wanted to uh, translate the 
90 foot stone, they took it to the language teacher at Dalhousie, Dalhousie University. Well, Dalhousie University was founded by uh, the Earl of Dalhousie, and he was formerly the uh, Grand Master of the Scottish Freemasons <laughs> until he became the governor of Nova Scotia. Well, the book that I found the treasure in and found the three free, first three Freemasons in was dedicated to two more earls down from him. It was this guy's nephew, who was at the time the Grand Master of the Scottish Freemasons, and he was the acting Grand Master of the English Freemasons. Wow. So the Freemasons are a thousand percent tied into this. Yeah, it's seeing it's you can see the connections all over. And their last name was actually Ramsey, not Dalhousie. They were from a place called Dalhousie in Scotland, so they were the earls of Dalhousie. Mm -hmm. But their actual family name was Ramsey. Well, a David Ramsey, who was tied in with Sir William Alexander in the court of the king, he becomes a Freemason, and the three sponsors, if you want to call them that, or witnesses for him are... William Alexander Jr., Anthony Alexander, and Al Strachan, the first three Freemasons, are his sponsors for him to become a Freemason. And it was from him that the Earls of Dalhousie descended, that started Dalhousie University an hour away from Oak Island, and who were the leaders of the, of the Freemasons. And most of the diggers on, most of the people that spent money in previous digs were Freemasons. Uh, FDR was there. He was a Freemason. John yeah. Wayne was an investor. Errol yeah. Flynn and Admiral Byrd, they were all Freemasons. They were all invested in it. Uh, a lot of names that you wouldn't know unless you were an Oak Island fanatic, but people like Frederick Blair and the Chapels, a bunch of people like that were all Freemasons too. And even today, Charles, who is a Freemason, Charles Barkhouse is a Freemason, he gives private tours to Freemasons a couple times a year on Oak Island. <laughs> so, I mean, there's just so god darn many coincidences that um, what is the other explanation? That's what I always go to. All right, I came up with this by going through tons of old documents over two and a half years, and nobody else has come up with anything else that explains all this. So I may not have all the facts, exactly right i might be wrong on a year or a person's first name or whatever but the bigger story has to be the story because they're just what else you know there is no other explanation for all of this converging at this little area between halifax no uh, halifax new ross and oak island would make a nice little triangle yeah. right there of uh, all this activity and there isn't anything else anything else to explain it and nobody else has ever... Now, two other historians did start down this path. They both mentioned William Alexander, and one of them, Mark Finnan, he he wrote about three books on Oak Island back 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, he actually said that William Alexander is a good suspect because of all his contacts in Scotland, the fact that he was given Nova Scotia, and the fact that the carbon dating, he must have done the same thing I did, because he said a lot of the carbon dating matches the same date Alexander was there. But he didn't take it anymore. That was like a half of one page in his book. Huh. I've written three books now, you know. <laughs> and not to say anything bad about him. I'm just saying that here he was heading down that path. And then another historian, Court Lindahl, he's written a ton. And Court kind of takes every theory about Oak Island and explores them in his books. You know, he's not necessarily sold on one he's very expansive in, in his in regard even including uh, astronomy and all that but um he also mentioned uh the alexanders and the significance of them there but again he didn't go down the path that i did so nobody's gone down this path anywhere near as far as i have they hit it but they but never they, followed it they never followed they saw it and they said wow that looks like a nice path and then they didn't go to, then they didn't walk <laughs> down it you know I walked it down. So uh, there isn't any other theory that's got this much documentation, and it continues because I can't really say what was found or how it was found or anything, but uh, uh, some items, several items were found that right by Oak Island that have the stag motif on them. Yeah. And that there, it was dated from the 1600s. 
So now you have, oh, and and uh, John Strachan, not only did he own the Nolan Cross Loss and was a Freemason, but he had a ship that he called the Stag. Oh. So, uh, yeah. Another so, I mean, connection just, again. And, and they all came from Aberdeen in Scotland. I, I traced all the families back. I, tr- I connected how he related to Alexander Strachan and how the family split into two branches. And, but they, but the one branch ended up at Halifax. And, uh, so, uh, there's just these endless connections of, uh, all these family names, particularly Strachan, Alexander, and Ramsey right now are the big three names, but there's a lot of other ones. There's probably a couple dozen other ones involved, but these are the three big ones that, you know, Alexander's given Nova Scotia. He needs money. He gets these people off of the crime. Strachan's the one that steals the treasure. He signs as a witness. A relative of his down the road owns the Nolan Cross lots. And Ramsey, they found Dalhousie University where the Oak Island Association meets and where the language teacher (laughs) worked that translated the stone, you know, so... That's right now. That's I'm I'm kind of exploring on the show. When they had me on the show, they didn't mention the word Freemason at all. They talked mostly about the Templars, but they did mention the book where I found the treasure in, which was Edinburgh Lodge Number One. The hustle, the bustle. Oh man, I just can't wait to get out of the city. Sometimes get out on the fields with my Rudus Alter Seventy One. If you guys don't know what a Rudus Alter 71 is, head on over to rutus.com.pl and find out what one of the greatest metal detectors on the planet truly is. The Alter 71 is the metal detector I use, and it gets me out of this. This crazy sound. This busy bustle of a life. Get out in the woods, the wilderness, and enjoy the fun of metal detecting. So grab your Altar 71 and get out in the woods. Enjoy nature and find some history buried in the ground. The Altar 71 has 71 frequencies for great metal detecting. And it's easy enough to use straight out of the box, but still you can completely customize it to the way that you metal detect. This is a great device, a high range device at a low price. Check it out at rudus.com.pl. And discover new possibilities. And I have to tell you how I found that. Because it's a rare book. And uh, Cal Hancock, who is has been uh, Doug Kroll's partner in a website called Blockhouse Investigations for a number of years. All about Oak Island and anything they could find on Oak Island and their analysis of it and all that. Mm. He was and may still be the grandmaster of no not grandmaster the grand historian of the grand lodges of nova scotia which includes about 88 freemason lodges mm-hmm. and so he told me maybe you want to go find these two books he gave me these names of these two old books well i went looking for them i couldn't find them anywhere but i tripped over this other book and it was held by Cornell University and they had scanned it in and had a free PDF of it and that's how I was able to find all this stuff so even though Kel hadn't sent me to that book I still credit him with heading me down that path to find that book and uh, so uh, a lot of these a lot of these other books like there's this other book I found uh, somebody approached Doug about it and it was supposed to be uh, by a guy named James Burness, and it was she had a rough idea of the name of the title, and it was supposed to have twelve Templar treasures in it that were held by the Freemasons. So, they but they couldn't find it. So I went through all my sources in Scotland, and nobody could find it either. So it was like this book didn't really even exist. And then somehow I made a, a final attempt, and uh, the guy's name was not Burness; it was Burns. And when I put in or when I put in Knights Templar James Burns, there it came up. It was scanned in by Rutgers, I think, or somebody, and there was the book, and it had the Templar treasures in it. Now they weren't treasures like the Ark of the Covenant or anything no, like no, that. No. Yeah. They had like a 
gold-plated spurs that one Templar had used. They had a helmet and visor that another Templar had used. They had a Templar battle flag. So there were 12 different treasures. They're all written in French, and I don't, I took French in school, but I don't really read it. So I had to use a translator, and I translated them entirely, all 12 of them. And then if there was anybody mentioned or any place mentioned, I went in and did further research on those people or those places so that I could give them this whole package back to Doug. That was, I found the book, here's a PDF of it, here's all your Templar treasures, I'll translate them all. Well, none of that had anything necessarily to do with my story, except for the fact that the Freemasons were the ones that held the Templar treasures. Yeah. And to go back to the Ramsey name for a minute, I just got this the other day from a guy, and I've been, that was what I was working on today, which I sent a little email off today. But a Michael Andrew Ramsey gave a very significant address, famous within Freemasonry, to the Freemasons in 1736, outlining how the Freemasons developed out of the Crusaders. Now, he didn't mention Knights Templar specifically, but he mentioned the Crusaders, and he mentioned the Knights of St. John, which was a a uh, co-order with... They actually inherited a lot of Knights Templar land and all that when when, uh, they were dissolved. And so, um, here he's he's a Ramsey, too, and so... The gentleman that told me about him said, can you trace him back to these same Ramses? So I did some work today that gets them pretty darn close. And I always like to get like a second, like if I say, oh, yeah, this has got to be it. Then I go back in and drill down for a second or a third proof of it before I say that, you know, because I don't want to look like a fool and then have somebody write 10 days later and say, well, you're so wrong. It was even wasn't even the same family or whatever, you know. So that's where I'm at on that. But I wanted to give every I wanted to spill the beans to everybody that now we have another Ramsey connection. We have the the Dave Ramsey that was initiated into the Freemasons under William Alexander Jr. and Anthony and Al Strachan. We have the two the Ramsey that started Dalhousie University. We have the Ramsey that this book was written to that talked about the treasure, and we have uh, another Ramsey who spoke to the Freemasons in a famous address about how they were connected to the crusading knights. The crusading knights. Okay. Yeah, which which it makes sense. They're not going to openly say that they were part, uh, uh, you know, uh, descendant of the Knights Templar when the Knights Templar was still excommunicate from the Catholic Church anyway. Right. And a lot of the connections are that back in the day there was a Knights Templar with that name, and then later on, up in the 1600s, there was a Knights Baronet with that last name, and then they, there were Freemasons with that last name, and then there were people in the uh, area around Oak Island with that last name. Mm. So it's the same family and same clan, and you know, the apple doesn't fall much from the tree, because no. I've this is really how I got into all this writing, was ge- through genealogy, not through the nitty gritty of it but through the story behind it all and uh uh what i found is that if 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 your names now there's some names like smith and maybe mcdonald and johnson that it's not going to be it's not going to hold true for necessarily but a name like mine like mcquiston we know we're all from the same guy because we about uh two or three dozen men took the DNA test, no matter how the name was spelled or even pronounced, because some of them pronounced it different, we all, we were, they they actually said we were a very tight bunch that went back to a guy 500 years ago. Well, we knew the guy, because that was already in our family tradition. We don't, we knew who the guy was. Yeah. Named Bushton McDonald, and his sons became McBushton. And the Surian McDonald McBushton, he descends from that line, as I do. Hmm. And so, if you have an odd name, an odder name, like Strachan or Ramsey or McQuiston, uh, you're like 99% going to be related, unless there was a, 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 an adoption or something like that, you know, some bizarre thing happened. You're, if it's within the last four or 500 years, you're going to be related somehow, you're, you know, if you trace it back far enough. Whereas with a name like Johnson... Some could have come from Norway, and some could have come from Scotland, some from England, whatever, and they may not even have ever known each other. 
So it's harder with names like that, but it's easier. The more obscure your name is, <laughs> the easier it is to trace it back. It's odd, but because um, the more likely every single reference you ever see about that name is your ancestor or forefather. So where I'm at on this right now with this part of it is I'm trying to further explore this nexus between these early Freemasons, how they were related and interacted with each other and how their heirs ended up in the area of Halifax in Oak Island. And I think that could probably be a book on its own, but I don't know if I want to write another book. <laughs> it takes a lot out of you. I want yeah, to tell you, uh, anybody that says something about, oh, it's just a book, he's trying to sell a book. I mean, you know, spend nine or months or a year almost every day and staying up sometimes till three or four in the morning and going, you know, spending money to get this translated or whatever, you know. I mean, you've got so much time and money into the things and the royalties on them are not that great to where, you know, the people like, what is it, James Michener or, yeah. you know, people that level. Yeah, they're millionaires, you know. Yeah, they're, they're, they're names. I'm never going to be a millionaire. I'm yeah. doing this for the love of trying to figure this damn story yeah. out. Yeah, and get your – well, it's, it's, honestly, uh, for your, something like what you're doing right now and listening to this and seeing uh, – Kevin Whitmore said it's uh, fascinating. It makes the world such a smaller place, and it's really amazing thinking about something like Oak Island, and I think – Honestly, from everything that I've been hearing, I think your uh, theory behind this whole thing, I think it's probably the best put together theory that I've heard from the island, period, because it all makes sense. You've got the um, location of these three, four names all within a small area around Oak Island. And when you back up another 100 years or 50 years, you have that connection of those names again in Scotland yep. prior to everything actually kicking off. And there's, there's no such thing as a small coincidence, especially when it comes to something like this. Uh, we got these names connected to a missing treasure in Scotland, and then all of a sudden these names are now founding uh, Nova Scotia in the New World. And it's in all... Halifax and founding the first Masonic Lodge in Halifax. Yeah. You know, the founding the university in Halifax. You know, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. And it almost doesn't matter how far you go back because the Keith family, which was the Marshalls, that their treasure was stolen, they went all the way back to David the I, who financed the Templars and gave them all kinds of property in Scotland. The Strachan family went all the way back to a guy named uh, Walter Gifford, who his brother was a Templar, William the Templar, they called him. And he was the ecclesiastical advisor to David I. <laughs> and my family, the McQuiston family, goes all the way back to a guy named Angus Og, who led Templars at the Battle of Bannockburn and who people, some people feel was wounded in the Holy Land, fighting in the Crusades, and came back up and died on an island in Scotland, off the coast of Scotland, and, and is buried there. Hmm. So, uh, you know, pick a family, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. and then all you got to do is start looking, and pretty soon, well, the McLean family's one, the John McLean Smith, go back to James McLean, the Freemason, and Lachlan McLean, the Knights Baronet, and yeah. Lachlan McLean, the Knights Templar. So there's tons of families. Uh, I, in my second book, Oak Island 1632, I actually explore quite a few of the families. I, I'd say about, I'm, I'm betting maybe 20 families where I I take what their link was to the Templars to show that there is this link between the Templars and and the Knights Baronet. And some of the, some of the connections are through land. Like in the case of Alexander, his family inherited or was granted two plots of Templar land, which they still own, and they have a castle on it today. Uh, one of his partners was Robert Gordon. Well, they actually own an old Templar castle still today. They still own this Templar castle from the 1300s. The Campbell family was one of them. They uh, had a there. They have a story within their tradition of a, of a Templar who, after they were dissolved, he had a, a, a he dressed in beggar's garbs to make his way back to Scotland because uh, he didn't want to get killed on the way back, you know. But he kept his uh, 
Templar mantle with a red cross on it underneath his ragged clothing. And then when he got home to prove that it was him, because he'd been gone so long, he just, you know, took off his junk clothes and there was this Templar garb underneath it. So there's just so many families that were part of the Knights Baronet that have some kind of link to the to the Knights Templar and forward to the Freemasons. And I got to tell you this little story. I know we're probably going long on time here. And no, it's I fine. Was, but I was asked by, when the word got out in the local papers and everything that I was working with Oak Island people, the uh, lodge up in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is about a half hour from me, they asked if I would come and talk. They, they wanted me to talk for one half hour about the connection, be, what I thought the connection was between the Knights Templar and the Freemasons. And they said specifically, don't talk about Oak Island, just talk about this connection. Well, you already know from hearing my story that it'd be almost impossible to tell even that part of the connection in a half hour, but I took on the challenge. <laughs> so I've never been in a Masonic Lodge before, and I walk in, and it's this big hall with these kind of theater seatings going up about five or six rows all around it, plush, velvet, uh, royal color, and they put me at a podium in the middle of the room, you know, and I'm like, holy cow, let's talk about intimidation, you know. <laughs> so... Uh, but they were kind, but the guy, the first, one of the guys that came up to me while I was getting ready, he was a pretty old guy, and he said, he said, I want to tell you, I've been looking for 40 years for any connection between the Freemasons and the Knights Templar, and there just isn't any. And I said, well, I'm not here to argue that there is. I'm just going to show you what I've found, and you guys can make up your own mind. He said, all right. So he listened intently. So I got done with my half hour. I was watching my iPhone to make sure I wasn't going over I get done, and I said, well, are there any questions? The next hour they spent asking questions about Oak Island. <laughs> I wasn't even supposed to talk about it, and they, they, they questioned me for another hour about that. So I got done, and uh, so I was selling some books and talking to people, and they were showing me some of their documentation, and I was showing them some of mine. And this old guy was standing in the wings the whole time, and then when everybody left, he came up here and he said, I can't believe it. He said, I've spent 40 years on this and trying to find out what you found out. He said, I think you have the connection I've been looking for for 40 years. And boy, did I feel good about that, you know, because uh, even the even the most ardent skeptic they had in the room was coming up and saying, yeah, uh, I believe you, you know, so. Oh, man, that takes us to the end of part two of three of the secret of oak island thanks to james uh mcquiston for coming in and talking with me for almost three hours on the full interview the full talk uh the, you can see this story is getting deep and deeper and deeper and it's just starting to connect so much it's just there's way too many circumstances for this to be just pure coincidence so i uh, hope you guys are enjoying it like i keep telling you check out uh, gdapod.com for all the news and information of what you're hearing today and uh, also for um you know any upcoming shows that might be live we do live shows as well with some of our guests and uh, it's really fun you guys can completely interact with us uh that's Please check it out. Like I said, it's at gdapod.com. So I want to go ahead and thank you all for coming in and listening. Uh, from myself, 42, who's not with me on this episode. And uh, from producer Luke and producer Dave, the two brains behind the operation. Without, I could not look half as decent as I do. Uh, thanks for all three of you guys. Uh, you truly are the wind beneath my wings, everybody. You're the treasure at the bottom of my money pit, all right? So uh, we'll see you guys real soon. Please subscribe, and uh, you'll get notifications when the next one drops next Monday. Uh, you know, so until then, uh, everybody, we'll see you out on the fields, y'all. Let's dig it up. <laughs>